Hello, and welcome to Cardboard Alchemy Weekend. Uh, I'm Peter Vaughn. We do this every Friday or whenever you want to watch this. It's a behind-the-scenes look at a cardboard publisher. <laughs> I guess we make more things than just cardboard. We make plastic and wooden pieces. We make games here. So uh, we are ready to, to game on for the weekend. I've got Rosie, our communications manager, with us. Hello. Helping me out with the comments and so forth. Hi, Rosie. Hello. And... Uh, we have some fun topics today. Let me talk about what we're going to go over and we'll get it we'll get going. So we are going to talk about the steps for making a game. Uh, I thought about doing this because we have several games in different stages of production. I thought it'd be fun to talk about that. We also are going to talk about the importance of playtesting. I had an awesome playtest event over the weekend with some members of Cardboard Alchemy and I want to highlight that. We're going to highlight our current contest going on that ends soon because we always give stuff away around here. I don't know if anyone noticed, but we like to do that. Um, then we're going to talk about, uh, we have a crowdfunding uh, shout out. We like to fund games. And so we'll shout one out. Um, conventions is the topic that is going to be heating up this year as to where is everyone going. We'll chat about that. Then we're going to play a round of Letter Tycoon. That is a game designed by Brad Brooks who's the co-founder of Cardboard Alchemy. And the new version of Letter Tycoon is out right now. So we're playing a game every week. And we're going to do that all the way until the end of February, where more people can win a copy of Letter Tycoon. And then finally, we'll do questions and answer. If there's anything burning, there's some stuff you want to know about any of the games we make, Flamecraft, Critter Kitchen, Andromeda's Edge, Mission Catastrophe, or our future games, or any game that you want to chat about, tell us what games you're playing, so forth and so on. So let's talk first about making a game uh, and the steps to making a game. I happen to put, uh, let's see, I've got some steps here that I want to put up. So game making obviously starts with an idea. You you get, you're like, oh, I, I know the perfect game. And, and then that's usually where they all die right there. I mean, not they all die, but that is a lot where a lot of games just, just absolutely die. I got about 20 ideas currently. Uh, most designers have a ton of ideas in their head. It is it is getting that idea down to paper, which is the hardest part. It is by far the hardest part. Uh, then when you get it down to the design, uh, that is a loop. That is a loop that could take, uh, you could go, you get really lucky and the idea just like crystallize. You wake up out of a dream and the idea crystallizes on, onto cards and you're like, done. Uh, it's not always that easy, though. So sometimes uh, you iterate, 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 and it never makes it out of design. So that's why I have the next one. The signing of the game is in green. That is the uh, another party. That is usually not yourself. That is somebody else going, yes, what you have is good enough that it will be made. This is usually where the publisher comes in and will take the game at, or, or agree to look at the game further because you notice it's not done at that point. You then have to develop the game. And that's another loop where a game can uh, languish and never come out of, because it has to it has to become a product and it has to be officially good enough to go on. And not uh, games are very expensive to make, so not every game's lucky enough to make it to green light where it'll be put into production. There's a pre-production phase with graphic designers and finishing of all sorts of box and component steps, uh, getting the files to print. Then there's a production step. It actually is manufactured. Usually this is done in China. This can be done in Europe. It is, uh, it's a big project. Uh, then there's fulfillment, which is getting it across the ocean or to uh, warehouses. And then finally, the release. Now, if this is a non-crowdfunded game, you don't see anything usually. It depends. You might hear people talk about the design ideas, but you'll see almost nothing until then. The release of the game or... I guess I didn't put the marketing phase. You'll see something right before the release of the game. But I have another step that I want to insert here, which is a crowdfunding step. This is something that Cardboard Alchemy does because we are looking to find out what... We have a step where we want future potential customers, backers of the game to comment about the game to basically help us green light and put it into production. So while we've signed it and while we have started development of it, this is an important step for that started uh, a few years ago, um, 10 or so years ago when Kickstarter first came out. This was a very interesting step. It allowed people who didn't have the traditional sign of a publisher to 
actually see if a game was viable for the market and then produce it. Sometimes produce it themselves, which is a whole ball game uh, that, a, that a lot of people went down that journey and found out that <laughs> becoming a publisher is quite an adventure, uh, just like I did. And so those are the stages there. And I'm going to talk about a couple of games that, just for an example of how long these things could take, I have a couple examples. So, for example, my very first game, What the Food, What the Food was done in a year. So I had the idea, and I designed it really quickly. I crowdfunded it myself. Production was only about six months. So six months of design and development, six months of production. Voila, one year later, I had a card game. Doesn't always work like that. Rise of Tribes, which I made with Brad Brooks. He showed it to me one lunch. Uh, I thought, oh, this game's great. And we started to work on it. We did, he did design and we did development for about a year. It went to crowdfunding in like a year after that. It got to backers a year after that. So it was about two years for Rise of Tribes. And then if you look at Dwellings of Eldervale, that is a game that I told Luke about on a car ride in 2015. And it took till 2019, four years later, for it to get to crowdfunding. And then it came out in 2020, 2021. So about a six-year ride for Dwellings of Eldervale. So that is the kind of things that can happen. Now, the reason why I wanted to mention is because it's kind of an exciting time for us right now because we have uh, we have Andromeda's Edge, which is at the tail end of pre-production. And we have Critter Kitchen, which is at the beginning of pre-production. And those don't usually, it's a, it's a very intense time because they're both in a similar place. Although the reason for that is because pre-production for John Edge has taken a long time with miniatures and wood pieces and acrylics. And, and it has a lot of dev because it's such a beefy game. Whereas Critter Kitchen hopefully is a much shorter uh, development cycle, a pre-production cycle. And then we have other games like Flamebound, which is in the late design steps where we have just sort of, uh, we've signed it and we have started working on the dev, but now there's another loop that I was talking about. So that could take as much as it takes. Um, more on that project later. And also Whisperwood is also in the signed and in the design dev stages. So we have like lots of different stages as we go. Flamecraft, of course, our game with dragons is in the release step and it has been for a while, but we're continuing to support it, which is also fun. So we're adding more steps to our Rosie knows all about the extra steps that go into after release. It's not done either. Um, that's just that uh, we talk about how this is behind the scenes. And I hope that is of interest to you. If anyone is watching this, who's a game designer, uh, feel free to chime in with a game that you have gotten out and released and how long it took. I'd love to know the different timelines. You know, can can you beat a year? Does it go longer than dwellings? I mean, what are the what are the time frames? Um, I know that we have uh, Peter Hayward. Peter C. Hayward is uh, is in our chat usually or watching this later, and he's done designed a lot of games, and he's published a lot of games. So I wonder how what his time frames are. So uh, that is that, and Chris Strain could talk about how long troubles asking for troubles took. All right, but let's go on to our other topics and we can do more questions and answers if anybody else wants to talk about the stages of a game. So our next topic was playtesting and playtesting is an important part of that design and development loop. Playtesting is where you find out if anyone besides your mom says that the game is good <laughs> um, or your best friend or, or you know, even your you know, even if the publisher likes it, you do have to kind of show it to other people and find out what the sticking points are and the questions are and so forth. So one of the things that uh, I do in Los Angeles is uh, for the couple of friends, we started a group called First Play LA, which is the first chance to try games out before they're a thing. Some of them never get made into a thing and some of them do. And I run a monthly event where we let designers sign up for a time block so that you can like reserve a table, show people your game, get feedback, and then the next table comes in and we do that as a big loop. And so there's a lot of designers that come. Um, our local design pool in Los Angeles are really kind of good. We've got a lot of published designers, a lot of up and coming designers, a lot of pu different publishers in Los Angeles. So it's a lot of fun. Uh, this is also because I didn't see a lot of types of these events. I didn't see these types of things on the 
calendar. So I made my own. And so sometimes you got to do that. There are things out there called um, unpub events, unpublished games. That's an East Coast uh, type of thing. There's also something called Protospiel. I believe that was made in the Midwest. And it's this is like what I run in Los Angeles, like a mini protospiel. It's kind of a, a one day event, whereas protospiels are usually a whole weekend of things. But anyway, it went great. We we had Flamebound on the table. We had um, I had a couple other games I was looking at on the table that uh, designers were showing us, and of course I was running it for all of the I think it was like fourteen different designers put the games on the table. So it's a lot of fun. We had Chris Strain in the house. So Chris was at that event and we played lots of games to sort of find out what is the next Cardboard Alchemy hit game. More on that to come. Uh, all right. So our next topic is contests uh, because we're running a contest right now. Let's see if I can find our image that Rosie made for our plush contest. We have something that's like a Valentine's Day. Even though Valentine's Day over is, still, is over, you can still win. If you go on our Instagram or go on our Facebook, and this is on the Cardboard Alchemy uh, page on Facebook or our Cardboard Alchemy Instagram, you can tag some friends, name what type of dragon they are, and win a set of plush. I love these plush. And uh, a better way to make a friend. <laughs> I, I love the comments on, on, on there where people are like giving reasons why someone's a bread dragon or reasons why someone's a, a potion dragon. It's pretty funny. I'm amazed people have three friends. No, no offense <laughs> to people, but like <laughs> I have like one friend. <laughs> one friend is all it takes. Just tag that one friend. You can still win. <laughs> um, that kind of just ends this weekend. We always have contests though. So um, we'll have more and there's our newsletter coming up with more ways to win. We also now to do our crowdfunding shout out. We have a funny thing that happened is that our potion bottle, <laughs> our cardboard alchemy potion bottle was featured in a crowdfunding game that's on right now. There is a game called uh, Rocket Ranchers Herding Cats in Space, which, you know, I mean, that title alone is just silly and fun and awesome. And they decided to put the potion bottle in one of their cats. So I think it's just kind of amusing. Um, so if you like uh, card games that sound whimsical and funny, uh, go check them out. We'll have the link to the Kickstarter in the description. Rocket Ranchers. I want to play the, I want to get the Space Cat. It's kind of funny because we were making Andromeda's Edge when the time they reached out. So I think they just thought of us as a space company. So it's just, it's a space thing. It's a space potion. It's fun though. We need uh, the entirety of space in their game. We're the, the only space element. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You want to go to space? You want like cats? Done. Absolutely done. So there's a crowdfunding shout out for you. Now let's go on to our next topic, which is conventions. Now I'm about to go to the Gamma Trade Show, which is a, a sort of an inside, um, it's um, an industry event more than a retail event. So usually conventions for board games, you go and you buy board games and so forth. This one is more for all the publishers and retailers designers also uh content creators to meet up and it's got us in the mood to think about what conventions we're going to be at so rosie's also going to go to aircon in march and and we're going to Ooh. add a um we'd like to know what game conventions you're going to what you're looking forward to and then when we do our newsletter which is coming up soon we're going to ask everyone to name the convention they're most excited for uh, or what they're going to their top convention to win something. So think about what conventions you want to go to. If you don't know what conventions you go to, then you could maybe use this stream when people type in like, oh, I'm going to uh, Dice Tower East, or I'm going to Gen Con, or, or I'm going to Origins. You can like find out more about the conventions available out there. Um, my next convention besides Gamma will be UK Games Expo, where I actually get to meet Rosie for the first time. I'm going to get the game <laughs> on. Uh, that's going to be fun. You can actually play games in person. <laughs> that's right. Oh, I'm so excited. So Now you well, get to see how much I walk around with a phone filming attached to my hand 24-7. <laughs> nice. Yeah, that's going to be fun. I love that show. I've been one time. Um, it's a really good, solid show. Um, I have my own favorite show, though, so I will save that 
uh, maybe uh, for the show. I'll see what people say in the chat and I'll chime in. All right. Well, now let's get to Letter Tycoon because we, we want to get right to the games. You know, this weekend, another opportunity to play games. We're going to start with Letter Tycoon as we do on this stream. This is a game designed by Brad Brooks, as I mentioned, and I helped develop it and publish it. So I was one of the people that put it. I was the one that that basically signed it and greenlit this game. So I'm very happy about this game. It's coming back out. It's Travel Edition. Um, here, I'll show this, this box that we have here. Let me go back to the main video. So this box right here, this is the Travel Edition of Letter Tycoon. And it's now on the Breaking Games website. Uh, the Breaking Games is the uh, partner publisher that put it out for us. And they have it now for sale. But we're going to play around. We have an orange team and a green team. For those watching past episodes, Orange Team is the, right now uh, playing on stream, and Green Team is the away team. The While we're out on YouTube, you could also play. And you could win by throwing out words on either team. You play both teams. So let's talk about what happened in the last week. So currently right now the score is, after last week, it's 23 to 27. And as I say each time, those are deceiving a little bit because the the numbers there are the count of the letters that you own. And the, when in a two-player game, the trigger is different for two, three, four, and five players. But in a two-player game, the first person to get to 45 points in letter patents is the one that triggers it. But then the end score is actually coins and stocks you have in the bank. So if you look at orange, uh, 23, but with 11 coins in the bank and nine stock, meaning that they actually have 43 points. And green... Our away team has got 27 with five coins in the bank and two stock. So another seven points for 34. So green still has some catching up to do. Each team has five patents, five letter patents, because we've had five rounds and has bought five letters. And each team has two powers because you can buy letters that have powers on them. Now, we're only going to play Letter Tycoon to the end of February, so we might not see a full game, but we're getting to the really juicy part of the game right now where you don't want to use the other team's letters because if you do, you give them money. And you want to use your own letters and strategically put the letters that have not been bought yet into your words so that you could possibly snatch the remaining letters. So if you look at what has been bought here, um, there are there's half the alphabet gone. So you can see that the T, the highlighted ones that are the most value that are left are the T and the N, uh, and the R is a good one. And then there's a couple of uh, uh, patents that are the light color that are have powers left on them. So there's a couple things that... Uh, but let's talk about how we got here. So if we go back, let's see what word orange made the word unite. We stuck with a very small word that began and ended with vowels because we own the B patent. And the B says if you can bookend your word with vowels, you score double. So orange scored uh, six bucks off of unite and used it to buy the I and still has plenty of money left and only had to give $1 to the green team for that E that they used. So it was a pretty solid small word to do that. Then green responded and thank you very much for all of you that chimed in. We heard lots of great suggestions. We went with frogs, which means Rosie might be leaving the orange team to defect over to the green team. Not my, it's done. I'm gone. Frogs, and frogs. <laughs> frogs, done. And bear. And the reason why uh, frogs was particularly good is because green owns the K. And with the K power, if you only use one vowel, and you can see frogs only has that one orange vowel, you score double for that. So they scored six bucks off of that, two bucks off of bear. Although it's worth noting that bear gave orange two bucks also because orange owns the B and the A. So when we were talking that through, I asked Brad what he thought about that, because of course you could have kept the word bear off of it. Um, but Brad thought, well, getting two bucks ourselves is good because we need money to buy letters. So with all that being said, or, uh, Green decided to buy the O, which is a vowel that will hopefully help them stay uh, active against the orange team, which is kind of running away with this game. So that's where we are. Now we're going to go into the orange play. So orange has kept the S and the W from last week. 
And the new board of community letters is G, T, and J. So that's a lot of consonants. Let's see what orange gets dealt in their hand. It is a U, an E, an L, an I, and the Q. Now, this is the, the, the deck's about to get shuffled, so the Q had to come in. Q is an interesting word because if you use the Q, it's the only letter that has a doubler on it to start with. It also has a power. But if you use the Q in a word, it's actually going to make that word double. So Orange has now some choices to make. And if you are playing along, let's go. Let's figure out what we want to make here. So we did get Delta. Uh, Chris is pointing out that we got Delta Q and the U, which is a good thing for the Orange team. Uh, obviously, there could be a word to make here, right? And I. Uh, Q-U-I is, is good. Right. So we've already quilt. got... Just so quilt. There you go. Mm. It's the first word. Now, we also have the Z power, so we don't even need this S because you can make a phantom S, and that doesn't pay out. Remember, the uh, green team does own the S, so you could make quilts. That's one option. And a Mesa's quest. Ooh. And then I see quest. Let's put that up there. Now, Quest does use, this is the kind of things you got to think about. Quest uses the E on the green team and the S on the green team. So that would be paying out $2, but it's a five-letter word. Well, with an S, a virtual S on the end as well. It's actually a six-letter word. With the Q, it doubles. So it would be $4 on a stock doubled would be $8 in two stock. And you would pay out $2 to green. So if that's that's one way to go. I also saw quilters. Do we have an R? There's no R. <laughs> so this is a got to watch what letters you actually have. So quilters <laughs> will not work. There's some dreaming happening here. <laughs> <laughs> There's a good letter for that, which is if you buy the um, sometimes if you buy the X, it can help you duplicate a letter. But we don't ugliest have... ugliest seriously. Can we spell that? Wow. I'm glad that we have Esther on our team because her spelling ability is scary. Ugliest. Now that does not use the Q, so let's compare that. That means it's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's $6 on a stock, and that gives a green, uh, I believe, just $2 still. So I do think quests is better for eight. It's a uh, eight dollars and two stock and gives out two dollars. But ugliest is a great word. Is um, quilts better because there's no e and s in it, or quilts let's better? Let's see what we got here with quilts. And of course, we're using the virtual s. So what that means is that is six. And that so that's going to be eight dollars in two stock, and it only and it doesn't use, yeah, it doesn't use the e, doesn't use the s. Solid right there, that's a good word. Chris Chilly. wants us to quit. That's what he wants us to do. <laughs> the team game, Chris. You're in both both sides. We mm -hmm. heard you last week. You were playing along. <laughs> I think this is a good solid uh, word. Should we lock it in? Yeah, I love a good quilt. It's quite cold in the UK, so I have about four. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that, I'm going to write that word down. That means that we're forming uh, quilts, which is going to get, like I said, $8 because it's doubled and two stock. And that's going to pay out green nothing. A whole lot of nothing. Animated. Sorry, the, cards are, the cards are colored to show uh, vowels and consonants. Correct. Um, when you see the Y, you'll notice that it's both orange and green. That's to indicate that you could use it either way. Orange is the vowels. So, and don't ask what the Q building is because I, I don't, I mean, we made I, a don't, No, what, like spiral staircase? We decided that the Q building, <laughs> we have a poster that's actually, that has all the buildings. If you buy the game, you get a poster. And it says you that as a quinine, quinine factory? Ah. Uh. So, <laughs> isn't it great? Um, the U is a, what is the U? 
It's a university. Ah. Oh. Yeah. But I love the T because the T is a time machine. That's awesome. <laughs> Big clock on the end of the time machine. My so, dissertation at uni was about the aesthetics of time machines. Yeah. And, uh, they, they're always like some bog standard old thing. They're never like newfangled. They're like a, right. a big yeah. clock or a, or a telephone box or a bath. <laughs> <laughs> or a bar, yeah. So we have E and W in our hand. We kept the W last time. Do we want to keep these two letters? That's the next question for our Orange Team members. Mm. I like Q building is questionable. That is true. That is absolutely true. Um, yeah, if uh, Anime asks about the letters owned already, we can actually show the letters that are owned right here. So we just formed the word, yeah, we have two decisions to make, which is what we want to buy, right? So we formed quilts. Now what that means is, uh, if you go back to what we can use, the Q and the U are available. We already own the I, so I'll throw that over there. Uh, we The S is already owned by, uh, we used a virtual S anyway, we didn't use a real S. So these are the letters that are available to buy and orange has plenty of money. So the choices, I think the best choices are either the T because it's a solid $8 takes down a bunch, a big, big letter or the Q uh, for fun, getting another power. Now the power of the Q is that you can actually toss a word, a letter out at the start of your turn. If you don't like a letter that's on the board, either in your hand or on the community board. Um, I think the T is probably a more solid bet right now, but of course, it's not up to me. gets us more points. Yeah, it's yeah. it's funny. Uh, Axel's like the time machine. Clearly, Brad went into <laughs> bet back to let past Brad know that it would be a thing. <laughs> uh, Axel has a joke on our Discord that Brad has a time machine he's working on. So it was made in Letter Tycoon. You can see the time machine was made here at this moment. Um, Actually, yeah. back in 2015 when Letter Tycoon came out. That's when Brad started. Can we only buy one? You can only buy one. So you do have to make a choice, uh, Q, U, L, or T. And then we'll, we will decide what to do with the E and the W in our hand. The J and the G go to the next team. So I hear a couple votes for T. So I think we're going to do that. Yeah, I see three votes for tea. So we're going to buy the tea, which costs $8, but uh, Orange had some money lying around, so that's good. Those letters then go away, um, and we do have to decide what to do with um, the E and the W. Ew. Ew, yeah, yeah. If we keep the E, it gives us a good vowel to use, but it is owned by the green team. If we keep the W, it is a consonant that's not as useful, but is something we could buy if we need to buy something. So there's always a risk of not getting a vowel, though, like with Scrabble and all those Correct. games. Correct. You could get dealt consonants. Absolutely. It's worth keeping the E, in my opinion. Um, I'm not so fussed about the the wobble E. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it it really is only it's a it's a cheap letter. It's really kind of only needed if we think we need something to buy. Because if you look at what's available to buy, um, now the T will be grayed out. So there'll be, you know, you're going to hope for like an L, M, or N. There's actually a lot of consonants left to buy. So it's probably fine to ditch the W. Um, I like that it's a wood. So the W, you can see the patent's got a saw on it. The artist, uh, Mac Schubert, was trying to tie that with the actual building, which is a wood wood cutting facility, um, kind of like a wood maker, a wood mill is the way we phrased it. So we're going to ditch that. Oh, Rosie? um, yes. The S should not have been discarded because we used a ghost S. You're right. You're right. Thank you. Well, the, the uh, community is uh, paying attention. Uh, we used a ghost S, so this is still in our hand. We can hold on to it or. I don't think we need to hold on to it though. If we have a ghost S necessarily. It's, yeah, the only reason to hold the S would probably be like for using two S's in the middle of a word yeah. or something, or using two S's at the end, and we have our ghost S for one of them. So I agree. The S could go. Axel doesn't want to ditch the W. Wants to hold that W. Mehodor wants to do so cute. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, Flamecraft fans in the audience saying, so cute. Which was my favorite shop until um, Stuff the Magic Dragon came along. So. Aww. 
There's a fun, um, I can't really talk about spoilers yet, can I? But in Flamebound, um, Sundara was recently looking. So Flamebound is our, our sequel to Flamecraft that's going to be coming up. We'll talk more about it when we're ready to. But uh, the dragons are going on an adventure. And Sandara thought about one of them visiting so cute and getting something for their outfit before they went on their adventure. So it's kind of a fun thing. So that store has had a lot of Easter egg things happen. Sandara drew that store on stream uh, and people commented. And as they did, a new fancy dragon that we never intended to be in the game, but Taylor was in that shop and then Taylor became a thing. And then Taylor ended up as one of the fancy dragons in the game. And so who knows? We'll have to see Taylor come back. That's adorable. Somewhere. Right, so what are we keeping? What are we doing? It, it sounds like they want to keep all of them. <laughs> all of them. We're keeping all well, of them. Yeah, because don't ditch the W and then maybe they don't mind ditching the S, but the S can only go at the end of the word. Yes, Chris, you're right. Chris is uh Chris is flexing. Uh, a lot of flame bound. <laughs> he did. Play a lot of flame bound. We we definitely uh, I haven't even played it yet. So before everyone gets uh, jealous, UKGE. Um, UKG. Yeah. <laughs> You're gonna get mugged. <laughs> <laughs> all right, do so we keep in all these? Yeah, let's do it. Up? Let's keep them all. All right, we're keeping all of them. We're gonna show what the uh green team is working with here. So now the green team use all the letters from their hand. So this is the board as it was with the orange team, but we're gonna need to get rid of the T because it was used and deal out an alternate uh, letter here. So the I goes out there, and this is the letters that now green has to work with for their community letters. And let's deal them a new hand of seven cards. So here we go, we've got a T, convenient timing, an E, a Y, see the dual color there, an N, an R, an L, and an A. So this is the mission for our away team. If you like playing Letter Tycoon and you want to help us out, while we're waiting for next week's stream uh, and building up to our last episode of Letter Tycoon, uh, help us out by forming a word. Now, the green team actually owns a, a special letter that allows them to make two words. So you can form two words out of all this, and you could win Letter Tycoon. We're going to pull a couple winners at the end of the month. Thank you guys all for playing. We love, we love, I love playing Letter Tycoon. It's very versatile. You could kind of get, with this travel edition, you can take it anywhere. It plays two to five. So I think you can, the two player game is like, you buy the whole alphabet between the two of you. It's a really good match. The five player, insane. It's like a couple letters are bought by everyone and then it's over because it's a much, it's a, it's the whole alphabet is eaten up real fast. So it's kind of a different vibe, but I, I also like that version of it. Um, so got to get quick, you know. The two-player has a chance to, I think, have your powers get used a lot. So, all right. That is, uh, that's our, our letter tycoon. And we are now going into Q&A. So we are taking any questions you have about board game making or talking about what games you're going to play for this weekend. That I actually recently advice. tried a game uh, with Brad and Chris called the Fox Experiment, which is fun. Um, super cute. Uh, it was a it's a Panasaurus game, so it's kind of funny because it is sort of the intersection of a lot of our friends. Because Alex Cutler helped to work on the dev. We know Jeff Fraser, who's the rulebook editor for Flamecraft, who actually designed Fox Experiment, and Peter C. Hayward made a solo uh, mode for that game. So. I don't know how I crushed Chris and Brad, but I did. So I apparently am good at um, take. Now, one of the most fun parts about Fox Experiment is, I will say, you are, it's based on an actual, it's, it's, the history of it is based on um, this experiment that happened in Russia, which was trying to see if you could take foxes and specifically breed them for nice characteristics. So to get them more domesticated. Um, and so in the game, you are taking two fox parents and making a baby fox and then trying to get certain characteristics to pass on. And what I think is really fun about that is as you take a baby fox card, it's a dry erase card and you could draw, you could write the name of your fox on there. I don't have a picture of mine, but I named my foxes after board games. So I had Expansity the fox, I had Asking for Troubles the fox. 
I had, um, I didn't have Viticulture. I had Tuscany. <laughs> Tuscany is a fox. Um, I had uh, Dwellings of El I had Eldervale the fox, and I had Andromeda the fox. Eldervale turned out to be the best fox. Spoilers. Um, anyway, Fox Exper Experiment was a game I played. Let's see, we got a question. How do you guys settle on which influencers get review copies? Is it just the size of their viewership? Now, that's a good question. I don't know how other board game publishers do this. When we were looking at publishers or reviewers for Mission Catastrophe, is the first game that we made at here at the company. And we were looking for passion and viewership. I think those are the two metrics because we would, of course, target um, the biggest names we could get. And then we also wanted, I will never forget how that's how I met Hungry Gamer. And Hungry Gamer has a relatively small channel, but sh huge shout out. I think they've passed 5K uh, subscribers and Hungry Gamer wrote me the best letter I've ever received out of anyone. Passionate with facts. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's when I'm going to do it. I will pass on the copy. I really believe in this game. I think it fits my channel. It's just like, Everything about that was a passionate uh, plea for that game. Turned out to be one of the best uh, like plays and, and showings of that. So from that point on, I think what we decided to do is go big and small, find passionate, passionate people. And another example is for Flamecraft, I got a very passionate letter from Bonzinator, who I had never heard of, who had an Instagram stream and was looking at games and said, listen, my husband bakes and i saw the critical role shop i feel like it fits everything about who he is and who we are and i love games and i think this game's cute and i want to get a copy and we had like one copy left and i i didn't know anything about bonzinator and i gave her a shot and she did an amazing stream and she she like pumped that game and she talked about that game and she really gave it a good look and since then has become uh one of our favorites to work with so we're always about trying to find those passionate folks. Uh, another passionate uh, shout out is to, after we were done making Flamecraft, someone made a tutorial for Flamecraft in stop motion animation. Uh, board game tutorial, I think it's board game tutorials. Um, you'd have to look at the Critic Kitchen campaign because as soon as we saw that, we partnered with this guy, Jason in Texas, who makes these stop motion animations to make one as our main how to play for Critter Kitchen. Super excited by that. So we also, I will, I will put another category in here. We also like to work with different people every time. So we don't want to see the same faces. So we're constantly trying to like, trying to find uh, diverse voices in the space and different audiences, different formats, uh, two people together or uh, groups. We use Tantrum House to play Critter Kitchen in a big group setting. So we like to see our games with different people. Sometimes when it's a strategy game, it makes more sense to get someone who's like going to do a rule book play by play. Sometimes when it's a uh, more easygoing, cozy game, as you will, it's better to do that the right channel for that. So, but it's a yeah, great- I, I find the subject really interesting because I'm on both sides of it and yeah. variety, quality, different voices, different communities, Different, like I think, I think having that variety is amazing, and there are just so many people now. So yeah. It's really just about how you communicate the focus of your channel, and make sure whatever you're making is of a good quality and it's clearly communicated. Yeah, we want to work with different people and and passionate people. So I I don't think it's about the big channel. I do think it's about um, just putting everything into it, standing out and being different, trying something. As Rosie mentions, it's now like a crowded space. So you also have to kind of say why, you know, we all, we had one person reach out to me and say, can I have a shot to do Flamecraft? And they had not started yet. And so I unfortunately had to say no, because there wasn't any evidence they were going to do anything. And, I, and they said, well, how do I get started? And I said, well, you should take a game you already have and make one, whether it's an old, uh, it doesn't matter if it's an old game, but show show us what you can do what you would do, how you're going to make yourself have a, a, a voice here. Um, once I see that kind of thing, I can say, okay, well, then you could get a shot to do maybe one of our next ones. Tim Chewin, 
Go you ahead. You have to do the latest hotness. That's one of yeah, the latest you photos. You, if you have a collection of games, that's probably why you want to do it. Start there. Like yeah. I started with all the games that I owned, and then after that, I was like, people started asking if I would feature a game. I'm like, oh yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, I'll have a look at that. But I never really. I just wanted to feature the games I love, and that should be where the passion starts. Yes, it should be on the games you love. And and if you take where Rosie's at now, she's bombarded with games. <laughs> <laughs> I just so, I just got the two new Oink games as well, which is really exciting. Go. So yeah, yeah. that so, bombarded is the word. <laughs> so you know, it's cut because, and I will say that I saw that passion on TikTok. I saw what Rosie was doing. If you look at the way that Rosie does her TikTok unbox, a uh, tick TikTok <laughs> unboxing. <laughs> They are some of the most innovative ways of showing a game. And unboxings are boring usually. So if you do something like that and it's like, oh, that's exciting. I want to play that. Also, I noticed that she always ends with want to play. Um, there's an inviting way that those videos are created. And so that is what some of the things that stood out when we first reached out to Rosie to do uh, to partner up. That's why I don't know how to end a sentence. So I have to say want to play because I genuinely don't know how to end a sentence. I've got to do yeah. something. So I say it and I keep, people keep joking about getting like mugs and things with it written on. And I'm like, it's not original. I just don't know what to say in a sentence. It's all good. Um, uh, we also have a chat. Tim Shewin is really good with making videos. Now, that's the kind of passion I'm talking about because Tim made a video. So Dwellings of Elder Vale came out. Uh, I had left Breaking Games and I was looking at the videos that were created and Tim Chewin just gushed about Dwellings and he did it in a cinematic way and uh, just really blew me away. And from that moment on, I knew I was going to work with Tim on Andromeda's Edge. So it uh, you got you to gotta find something you love and then and pour it in. So that is how we look for videos. That being said... Says so we change it up every time in the future. If there's, we're always going to ask this question in our Facebook groups. If there's content creators that you like, that you want us to uh, work with, that I put an asterisk on that are willing to work with crowdfunding because sometimes the big channels or the popular channels don't do crowdfunding games. But if there's a channel that you know of that is particularly passionate or really good at what they do, we definitely want to hear about it. It's actually how I started working with Before You Play as well. I had never seen the channel, but people kept telling me in our Discord, you have to work with Before You Play. You have to talk to Before You Play. You have to talk to Before You Play. So that Monique and Naveen are amazing at describing a game and giving you a really good overview of a game. And they did that for our last campaigns. Um, so they're really solid. All right. So um, people having a quick chat about uh, Critic Kitchen saying it's not closed but we have charged some cards do you want to just ah uh, yes don't forget critic kitchen closed today that's it's not entirely accurate <laughs> but here's what happens we're in the phase of critic kitchen which is as i was mentioning earlier the pre-production phase and in crowdfunding we also are collecting the the orders from our kickstarter and we have what's called a, a pledge manager pledge manager has everybody's pledge and this is the part where you manage if you're getting any extras and you're checking out with your shipping, taxes, and whatnot, so that we can know if you're in or out. For example, some people buy a deluxe or they want to upgrade right now or they uh, want to add something. And then also, this is the moment when you lock in your address. Now, the address can still change because we understand that people do move. And so we allow, uh, what we do is we try and lock orders that are done except for the address. So that's what we did this today is we just locked orders. Now, when we lock orders, shipping and all those charges are officially um, charged. Uh, the credit cards are charged in backer kit. That moves you. That's our pledge manager. That moves you into another category, which is that you're ready to go. So that tells us a couple of things when we um, when we're going to get ready to make the units we're going to make in China. We know how many people are locked and loaded. And we estimate how many people are still going to come in. And of course, the smaller we can get that number, the better. So it is largely closed for most of the people. But that doesn't mean it's completely closed. The actual pledge manager is still open for a couple more months because we don't go to we, we're not going to production just yet. When we do go to production, we're going to make a last call. So that means that if you have not backed Curtis Kitchen, you don't know anything about it, but you're interested in our games, you can still get in for Curta Kitchen. 
the uh the deluxe edition of Critter Kitchen is pretty special and it's not something that's going to retail at this time. So it is a chance to get our fully loaded all bells and whistles edition of that game. And if you are more of the retail, you just like the basic copy, we also have the expansion included for free so that there's something for people who want to uh, get it later. I mean, you can get it later, but uh, now is a little bit of a special time because you get promos and perks and an expansion all thrown in. So this is one of the toughest times because we try and shout it out everywhere and keep it as open as long as we can until we're production starting and then we have to go. We have to go and then we have to close the door. So it is still time. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much. We're happy to uh, to coordinate. Oh my God, look at that cute logo. Cat in a spacesuit. Um, that's awesome. Do you guys go to Dice Tower East or Tantrum Con or just ones like Origins and Gen Con? Good question. I just actually went to Tantrum Con. That was my first time going. I love the Tantrum House peeps. And I wanted to see what their convention was like. I actually want, I almost got in the table flipping. They have a unique event called table flipping. I almost was in that. Um, fun fact, during their pandemic year, I submitted a table flip video where I flipped all of the Dwellings of Elder Veil contents. I, I don't know if that's recorded somewhere, but I do like Tantrum Con. Um, I would love to go to Dice Tower East. I've never been. And Dice Tower West is right around the corner, which is closer to us. We do usually go to Dice Tower West. We're not going this year. So um, I'm going to go to Dice Tower East possibly to make up for that. But here's the catch. Cardboard Alchemy doesn't put booths on at shows. Why is a mystery of the universe? Well, it's because we're a crowdfunding company and we focus our efforts on our online plays, our online community, our online groups. We're, we're all about crowdfunding and that's where everybody, everyone who wants to crowdfund is generally speaking online. It also expands us into multiple regions. We don't, we don't limit ourselves to just local cons in the United States. That being said, we do two types of conventions. We partner with Lucky Duck Games. That's our retail branch. Basically, Lucky Duck Games takes all of our games to retail in lots of languages. So when they have a big show, we sometimes show up at that show and get tables with them. And then the second way we show up at cons is, well, usually Rosie or myself at this point are the ones that are addicted and go to many shows, regardless of whether or not Cardboard Alchemy is there, at Lucky Duck's booth, which means that you could probably find us. I'm known to go with a couple of promos in hand or Flamecraft goodies or stuff like that. So we will be saying to everybody in our Discord and our Facebook groups and our newsletter which cons we're going to pop in at. That information is actually going to come out soon when we lock down our big shows of the year. We'll know all that detail. Yeah, we have a problem. <laughs> what? Oh, yes, we do have a problem. 100%. <laughs> I used to go to, when I worked at Breaking Games, I went to 14 shows a year. Uh, so a little bit more than one a month. I am back down to about six to seven shows a year. Um, if we I had that in the UK, I would. I don't, we don't have it, sadly. Yeah. There isn't a London one. It doesn't exist. Um, yeah, no very London. expensive city. So. Yeah, there's, there's no London board game convention. There's plenty of anime and stuff. And, the, and the MCM... Uh, has a board game section like in the middle of it yeah but yeah it's now um, i know what to do if i'm going to make a convention london get some food trucks yeah a lot of food trucks uh get yeah, some yeah. food trucks and then uh, get a con going in london yeah i mean aircon started in someone's backyard so yeah. um yeah. but yeah we've got we've got a few they're around but they're very they're very small and then aircon and UK games expo are the, the bigger ones every once in a while i'm tempted to like start one. And I'll tell you a funny story about that because my good friend, Scott Rogers, uh, shout out to Scott Rogers. He's one of our local LA designers. Uh, great guy and makes a lot of fun games. Scott and I are not invited to this. There's a con that is a secret one. Uh, it's not, that's not totally secret, but it's called the gathering of friends. It was started by Alan moon, who is the designer of ticket to ride. Uh, Alan, if you're watching, I would love to go to the Gathering of Friends, but I'm not yet. It's, it's like there's this process where a friend you have to invite, you have to like get invited, then you have to then I don't think you get an invite until you've been there a couple of years or something. So anyway, Scott and I used to joke that we're going to make our our Los Angeles 
gathering of friends and we're going to start our own. But every time I think about that, I think it's a lot of work. Conventions sound like, and I talked to Tantrum House about this. They've done Tantrum Con now for seven years and they do a really great job at it. They've got every part of a game convention covered. They've got events, special events. They've got play to win. They've got tournaments and they've got uh, open play and they've got speakers and they've got comedy shows and they've got lots of prizes. They've got merch. I mean, they, they really have the whole thing. And I look at that team of like, oof, I'd say it's like at least 10 people on their staff. That's like, they're, they are, they're working really hard to make that con happen. It's about a thousand at the first rule of board game fight. Club. <laughs> right. Can't talk about it. Sorry. If there is one in Los Angeles, we won't be mentioning it on this stream because it'll be secret. I really like this. I, I like the idea of the secret ones. It's unfortunately sort of a feel bad in some ways. Like there's a, there's one in Seattle or Vancouver that's like only 200 people and it's only invite. Like you have to be a friend of a friend of a friend. And, and I think the reason why they do that is because they can't grow past 200. And I think that's why I think that's the, the, the issue is that we're finding in board game conventions is that they could keep growing. You know, tantrum con is like, we're now at a thousand people. When we get to 1500, I think we have to stop. The hotel doesn't take any more. We'd have to grow bigger and it's a bigger infrastructure. Like Board Game Geek Con in Texas, they were at like 2,500 people and the hotel they had was great. And they were like, oh, but more people want to come. So should we make it go bigger? Then it will feel different. Like it's going to be multiple hotels or it's going to be like, it's just going to start to expand, you know? Do we keep it at 2,500? So I think they went to grow and I will say the vibe is just a little bit different than it used to be. It used to feel a little more cozy. Now it feels a little bit big. Well, um, Air Corner just doing more events. So instead of making it bigger than the space they have, oh, interesting. They just, they're just doing like Aircon West and other ones around in different parts of the UK. Whereas UK Games Expo started in a hotel and now they take over most of the NEC, which is a very large sort of hangar yeah. uh, space. Multiple times a year or multiple locations. No, you keep games just once, and I think it's just because there's like six people running it that it's just once. Once, um, it's a fairly small team and a lot of volunteers. Um, yeah. Whereas Aircon, I think they were like, we'll just do lots of little ones in hotels and grow those to help people from all over the UK. And the reason, um, yeah, the reason why this is happening is because board games hmm. are the best, and they're being, <laughs> and they're and more people are finding out, right? So more people are finding out how great this this hobby pastime you know is and as they do as as you know we're somewhat to blame you know, flamecraft is out there uh we're converting people into the hobby then people are like, this is great where do i go to share this with somebody else you find out about a convention and all of a sudden the convention you can't get tickets to your favorite convention so but they don't sell out immediately that's what's strange people decide yeah they don't go and and I, I do advertising for like Aircon and talk about it and host events to try and change up the different kinds of people that go, which I think is important. Um, but, you know, that's the difficult thing is reaching other communities. And I think that's yeah. what they're trying to do with the hosting stuff. UK Games actually just hosted something in a space center. They were like doing stuff at the British Library, doing stuff in different places to spread mm -hmm. the word out to different types of fans and different types of gamers, which is really cool. Yeah. So, yeah. It's uh, it's a lot of fun. So, yeah. Um, don't forget, we're going to have a chance in our newsletter to shout out your favorite convention. So be thinking about uh, the one you like to go to the most. That would be a tough call for me if I had to pick one because I do like BGGCon a lot. Um, I do like I do like Essen Spiel a lot. I do like a Pax U is really growing on me. I can't pick. It's going to be too hard. I like Kublacon is one I go with my son usually. I'm actually going to have to miss. KubelCon this year because because uh, I'm going to go to UKGE instead. It's like you got to pick and choose. Um, yeah. So, but uh, what's going to be exciting about the cons towards the end of the year for us anyway is that Andromeda's Edge should be at cons in game libraries on tables and Kerner Kitchen will have the same thing towards the end of the year. It'll be like a really exciting time for us to have. There's, there's almost like no greater. But there's there's different highs for board game creators. And one of them, of course, is getting your game signed and 
you know, seeing the the prototypes get uh, get the production and then seeing it released for crowdfunding. There's these highs of getting funded and having it come out, but but to see a, a, a people you don't know playing your game on a table is just it's a surreal. Uh, it's, it's an amazing feeling. I, I at Tantrum Con, I saw two people playing Flamecraft, and you know, just seeing that magic for the first time. And I went over there and I said hi, and I said, "Let me know if you have any questions," and I helped them answer our questions. And then it was just fun to see people go play the game. You um, like? Do you want me to sign that for you? <laughs> I no, I didn't. I don't. It's, it's a funny thing about. Um, I have. I've had. I've run to people who want a picture or a signature or something, but I'm not usually the one that I get asked that because I'm not the designer of many of our, our games. So I, I had, you know, someone came up to me at a, an event and they wanted, um, uh, they wanted, uh, I think because I was the only, I mean, I'm trying to remember if this was dwellings. I'm not, you know, cause it was just a person who walked into, it was really funny too. There was a person who walked into the BGG, game hall and just shouted out Luke Laurie's name, trying to find Luke Laurie to have Luke Laurie. But like Luke Laurie wasn't there. So I was there. I could answer questions about dwellings of other realms. Kind of funny. Um, and I did sign for Ellie. Who's in our chat. She asked us to sign her. There's companion cards in Flamecraft where Brad and Manny and Sandara and I um, are on those. So it's kind of funny. I did sign that one. That's, you know, I have a couple of games too, uh, where I have the designer signed them. They're really special in my collection. And uh, for those that don't know, on this YouTube, Cardboard Alchemy's YouTube, if you go back to some of our older videos, I used to do a series where we featured a game, got it signed by the designer, and then uh, someone in the comments won it. I may go back to doing some of those because those are really fun. I like seeing the designer get their game to new people that way and also getting a chance to have someone win something that's signed by the designer is really fun. Well, a lot of people are now talking about uh, getting things signed, going to conventions, playing games. I think our mission has been accomplished for today. Yeah. So game on, everybody. Enjoy your weekend. Uh, tell us about what you're playing. Don't forget to play for the green team so you can win Letter Tycoon. We'll see you around. Cheers. Bye. Game on.